In this third part of the tutorial, I'm going to go into painting and uh, troubleshooting all the things that can happen when you're painting and some other issues. Um, if you haven't seen part one or two of this tutorial, um, I have links for those in the description below. If you've prepped everything and gotten it all, you know, primed and cured and ready to paint, um, you've taken off all the handles and metal clasps, you've drilled all your holes, you've planned out where your gray blades are going, you've sanded it, it has texture, you've gotten everything ready to go, it's time to paint. Paint needs to be warm to work properly, so if it's colder than 55 degrees Fahrenheit, 12 degrees Celsius in your shop or outside where you're going to paint, you can either put it in the sun and get it warm, or you can um, put it in some warm water um, before you paint for about 10 minutes. Uh, just make sure it's not so hot that it burns your hand because then it will probably be too much for the paint can and it might pop out the bottom like happened to me. So keep your paint warm and happy. Think about the color you want to do it, of course, plan that ahead of time. If you're doing just a single color um, piece like this guy, that was just, that's easy. You're not going to have a lot of trouble or a lot of wait time. Um, if you're doing a two color one, you know, think about where that's going. Pick your paints, try your paints. Um, people ask what kind of paints I use all the time, and I don't think it matters. People have bad experiences with some paints and never use them again. People have great experiences. No one agrees. I mostly use like this Rust-Oleum 2X stuff. Um, it says paint and primer in one. I still prime, don't trust that. That's fine for small things, but I still prime everything because primer is primer and paint is paint and they're a little bit different. Having primer in it, sure, probably helps even more, but I don't trust this as primer and paint in one. So I use this all the time though. They have a huge range of colors, especially at my local hardware store. Some people like swear by and love like Montana colors. It comes in three different brands of Montana. It's confusing, but they're all um, slightly different. I've had some trouble with Montana paint, even though people love it. Like this, this kind um, is nice, but it gets kind of a pebbly texture and is kind of dry and chalky sometimes when I use it. I, I just, I'm not 100% on Montana. It has nice colors. It, it comes out matte and beautiful sometimes, and sometimes I get this chalky like dust puff from not shaking it enough, so shake it enough. I guess that's true with any paint, but it seems truer with certain Montana colors. Um, do light mists. Like, it's always been tempting. It took me 15 years to really learn that lesson by doing it wrong so many times, because I would get going hasty. It says like two times the cover, ultra cover. Oh, that's great, I'll just spray it on and be done in one spray. You're never done in one spray. Don't try and do it in one spray. It's gonna get thick if you do that, and it's probably gonna drip or crack or orange peel or all kinds of other problems. Do a light mist, you can still see the primer through it. Great, go have a sandwich. Come back in 20 minutes, mist it again. Come back in 10 minutes, mist it again. Like you don't, depending on the weather, if it's a hot day, I'll hit it every 10 minutes. Slowly, slowly build it up until it's opaque. Like go from every angle, go from every, every place you can. Um, give it time to cure fully, like hours before you flip it over, because if you do that, it might like stick to whatever you put it on, because that paint is still going to be kind of gummy for a day. So, you know, give it time to cure before flipping it or put it on a piece of paper, just on like two dowels that has the minimal, the least amount of area to stick to. Um, but give it time. Mist it. Enjoy it come back to it, you know, throughout a, a lazy Saturday and just hit it here and there, mist it, keep it out of the super hot sun, you know, keep it away from moist weather, just take your time and give it the, the care it deserves. Um, so once it's, it, your base color is on, like for instance on this helmet case, um, this is, you know, I did it all white first, right? Wait for it to cure. I'm going to tape off all these spots later. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of like stuff on top and pull some masks. I waited till the next day. I didn't do the red on the same day as the white. I never would do that because you increase your chance of pulling that mask and yanking off that coat underneath because it feels dry, but it's not dry. Give it a day. I think on these, I, I, I made two of these actually, and I think I painted them white and then I waited till the next weekend because the day after the Sunday, um, it was a little bit cloudy and cool, and I was like, you know what, not worth it. That paint is probably not fully cured because it wasn't very hot and dry overnight. It's probably not ready, and I just waited till the next week. I did something else. I worked on other pieces. I did some, I think I did the wiring 
parts that were going to go up in here um, because I knew I could work on that while it was curing because like that was going to be a lot of work anyway and it, it's better to not risk um, messing it up because I, I went fast so give it time um, then once you uh, once you once you do it you can start taping off your next color but definitely give it time to cure um, there are different kinds of tapes you can use um, you know there's green tape blue tape there's stretchy tape like this this yellow tape is stretchier so you can do like around curved shapes a bit better um, this purple tape is like a, a delicate tape so if you're a little bit worried that your paint is a little wet and you're you really don't want to pull on something that you're you're worried about use this delicate tape because it, it barely sticks compared to other tapes and you can peel it off a little easier without risk so look into your tapes they probably all work fine if you if, if all you have is blue tape it's going to be fine i just like having certain tapes for certain things um if you're going to use decals like vinyl cut decals um i used to before i had a vinyl cutter i bought these kinds of things all the time in fact these were purchased on etsy um, I think from a guy named Pie Man Graphics, and he would he would do custom arabesque. Um, actually, this one might be from someone else, but I need a lot from people. I bought, you know, Republic Cogs and all kinds of stuff from people. That a lot of those common symbols are available, and a lot of custom arabesque is available. Um, so I did I did a lot of um, purchasing before I I had a vinyl cutter. It's the best way to get this kind of look. I mean, taping that off would be a nightmare and probably wouldn't look good. This is a vinyl decal where you leave the decal on you can kind of feel it with your fingernail and it's kind of raised on there so that's one method the other method that i did here is to use a vinyl removable decal put it on um so i put the decal on before i painted it red painted it red and then i pulled off the decal and what's left is the white underneath same there um here i put on the removable decal and sprayed it yellow you know taped off everything and then pulled that off um i did that there too so you if you do that you're you're going to be able to get colors you couldn't get anywhere else so this kind of weird mustard yellow color it's like a yellow green color they don't make vinyl in that color that i've ever found um so i had it in a montana color and i was like oh i'll put that here and there and i'll make them all match so um doing a removable decal that you peel will allow you to get some designs that you can't get in vinyl even if you have a custom <clears throat> cutter that you probably can't find vinyl in every single color so peeling a mask is the way to get a really good design the downside to it is um, peeling a mask can also have a chance of pulling up the paint underneath whereas if you put it down you're not peeling it off as it's only a one-step process and you can clear coat it afterwards to make sure that it stays down there so this is I've, I've run into trouble lately especially where peeling that removable mask tore the paint and it was like it was done otherwise if I had just put it down in that black color it would have been fine but it was pulling it off that second time that was my downfall so um you can do that you can also kind of stencil stuff um you know use basic stencils and spray them but they're going to be a little have overspray on the edges I feel like vinyl masks are the best case scenario and like peeling off a vinyl mask when it, it's just like crisp and perfect like there's nothing like it <laughs> it's a great feeling and you can get any color you want so they both have their advantages but on my last case I started with that method and it I had two problem areas and I just switched to a solid mask as a solid vinyl piece that I leave on there because it it was less chance less risk masking anywhere where you're you're doing two colors you know next to each other um there's a chance that they can leak under any mask so if you put a piece of tape um across something and burnish it down surprisingly sometimes it still leaks it just does there's imperfections there's spots where the glue didn't quite stick there was a little dust there maybe and so the tape isn't stuck as well especially where you make a corner with tape to paint inside like what happened down here like these corners are very likely to leak if anywhere will because you're changing direction or you're meeting two pieces of tape or something like that so there is a method i use all the time and i i, I swear by it it's the best um which is where you you paint your base tone let's say white you tape off the area that's going to be red and then instead of 
painting it red right away, which could seep under that tape and onto the white, you paint it one more time with white. You spray it white everywhere you're about to paint red. It can be just a mist, but you kind of focus on the edges of the tape more than anywhere. If there is a leak, the white paint will leak under the tape and seal that hole and leak white paint upon white paint so you don't see where it leaked. It'll just be white on white, so it's great. Some people will use clear coat the same way, which is clear on white, so it'll work no matter what it leaks on, especially if you have a complex shape and it's not one color. Clear is a, a totally perfect option. But basically you spray what it's going on one more time and then you come in, it can be just 20 minutes later, you come in with your main color. Even if that paint's wet underneath, it doesn't really matter at this point because the paint has gone under those leaks and sealed those leaks. You still want to do your best to like burnish everything down and really push your tape crisp and sometimes you tape it up great. You go to paint it and it starts popping off a little bit. So the minute before you paint, just go over once more with your fingernail and just push it all into the cracks and make sure it's solid. Hit it with that paint, the base color paint, and then paint your color on top. And that will give it like the best chance of success. It will, it will keep everything from any leak from popping up. And like this, this was done that way. I added chips um, on purpose. Those are like resisted with, um, vinyl masking fluid, but like all the corners and everywhere I wanted just came out just so crisp. Everywhere I did that, it was just a crisp, crisp mask pull because I did that white on there. So there were probably some leak, leaking white spots. Um, and you can see that on some things where you like peel a mask and you'll see where the white leaked under and you can be happy that it didn't happen with another color. Um, when you're if your masks leak, you can still take care of it. I'm gonna show a couple techniques. They almost always fail a little bit somewhere, not always. This one did great, um, but sometimes you have a few spots just based on the surface or the angles or anything else. There's ways to fix it, but minimize it now and you're gonna be happy. Troubleshooting. Here's where we get to the part that nobody loves. On almost every case I've painted, something has gone wrong. The more I do it, the fewer things go wrong, but it still happens. And there are things you can do to fix it, but you still have to know, just go into this knowing that there is a pretty good chance some part might fail. And if it doesn't, you know what? What a great case, that's awesome, but you didn't learn anything. The way I've learned all these things is by doing it wrong many times. Um, you know, my very first time I tried this case was this, uh, this kind of like rebel -y looking, you know, it was like kind of a rebel case or whatever. I didn't wash the bin ahead of time. Um, I did a lot of prep issues. I've had to repaint and touch this up like 15 times and it still chips down to yellow all the time. It's flexible. It's not, not well adhered to the surface at all. I, I, learned, I learned a couple of very good lessons on that first one. And then I learned more on the next one and more on the next one and um, you know, it's it's always sad when you pull that piece of tape and it rips up a bunch of paint, it happens. So there are a couple things you can do to fix certain problems and I'm gonna go over them one at a time. Um, the first thing you can do is if you're starting to pull a stencil and you see like it pulling up the paint underneath the stencil, um, stop right there, take a breath. Maybe your paint didn't cure enough, but Odds are you're gonna have a trouble spot here and it's, you're gonna have to fix it. One tedious solution is you can cut with a very sharp blade around every spot on that stencil to make sure that when you're pulling up, it's not pulling the paint next to the letters. Sometimes that doesn't work and it didn't work on this last one. Um, but you can do that. I've, I've had, especially if it's only in one corner, you can just cut it with a blade and and uh, and your clear coat will help rebond that. But if that's happening, be prepared to do it again, to peel it off, to paint it over, or to put a cover plate. One thing I use a lot is a touch up with spray paint. You just take, um, if you have a big chipped off spot, you take a, um, a little piece of plastic or container or paper, and you go outside and you spray some of that color paint into that little pan. And then you bring it up back inside and you take a paintbrush and you paint back that color. It's going to have a little bit rougher texture, but it, it works. That's a thing that I use all the time to touch stuff up. If you get a chip you didn't like, 
if you get a, a, a it to pull up where you didn't want to, that's a way you can save it. So here's a spot where I had to go in and paint again. When I pulled this mask, it just peeled up and chipped back to black right in that spot. And I just sprayed some of this beige into a little cup. Actually, it's all along there too. I can see it. It's a very faint texture, but if I get it close enough, you can see the spots where along that tape pole, it chipped back to black. I painted some beige into a little cup and it came back in and I, I, I fixed it up. And then the weathering covers a lot of that. So you don't see it from very far away, but here's a spot where it, it chipped and I, I painted some paint back in. Even though I was chipping in it, I didn't want to have chips in that particular spot. One other thing you can do is to um, scratch off overspray. So if you tape something off really good, but the tape comes off while you're painting and you don't notice, you'll get something like overspray, like a little bit of misting around letters or tape edges. And you can take a small blade and you can go in while it's wet, like you pull the tape an hour after you spray it, and you see that overspray, that, that paint isn't fully cured yet. And so if you take a small blade and scratch at it, you can often scratch a lot of that paint away. If you can't get it all, you can always go back and touch it up with some of that base colored spray paint, but scratching it is a really good solution and I use it all the time. And it's kind of, the paint is still kind of almost gummy feeling when you do it. So it's really easy to do the day you pull that, the day you sprayed it, it's harder to do the next day and the next day after that. Cover plates are a really good solution. I will take a piece of plastic, um, you know, like some ABS or something, and I will cut it to the shape that I need to cover, and I will prime and paint and get that piece of plastic ready, and I will put it back over that spot, and I will do my stencils on top of it. Sometimes I'll do the stencil on its own somewhere else and then stick it on top. Um, that's really easy. You can use thicker plastic, um, I've used all kinds of stuff. I even used this really thin, like it's like one and a half millimeters. It's like a no parking sign from the hardware store. These are good for like little minor spots that you don't want it to be as noticeable, but cover plates are something that have saved the day a lot of times. And I'm gonna show a few of them here. Sometimes it just doesn't work. In this bin, in this section, just none of the stuff would stick. So I chipped some of it away, made a cover strip, put some E6000 on there. And this two millimeter styrene, it just, I painted it, primed it, you know, the decals just stick to it perfectly. So these are actually not spray paint decals, these are actually raised, you know, the, the physical part of the decal rather than a mask, because that was a little bit less risky too. This looks so much cleaner. And I've got another cover piece for this mess. So just go there. That'll look great. So I also use cover plates to cover um, things that weren't mistakes, like I carved away the logo and I put that cover plate on top. Um, I use them to enhance a look, to give a couple of layers of depth, but I use them all the time to fix paint mistakes. And they also have the benefit of adding more to the look of the, the case. It won't look as much like a store-bought case if it's got a few extra things. As long as you make them precise and nice looking like they were intended to be there, those can be great. Um, you can also cover things with like metal plates. Um, if you have a piece of metal like that, if that's in your technology, they look great because you know it's really easy to weather metal, to paint it without priming it with white and chip it back down to metal. That's a great look. Um, but cover plates are just, they're, they're something I use all over the place and they're really helpful because this plastic, no matter what, will be easier to paint and easier to pull masks off of than whatever your, your case is made out of. Because those cases, that plastic just doesn't always love paint. This stuff loves paint. So if you can do a perfect version here, you can do three of them. And the one that works, you can stick on there. Like you can have choices, you can cut custom shapes. Doing it on a piece of plastic is totally a great solution. And it's something I, I live by. 
one more good thing about Star Wars props in particular is you can cover a lot of your mistakes with weathering. There's a point in which something's too far to cover, but weathering does help if you have a really bad spot and you really don't like it. You can give it a lot of extra dirt and grime because Star Wars often is dirty and weathered and grimy and you can fix it. Um, I also tend to give this chipped look to a lot of my props because I like that that look of like it ding down to black on all the high points. So it also helps when I chip this pin like by bumping it on a doorway and the paint comes off. Hopefully it hits one of those high points. I mean it's going to look more like the object's supposed to look. So if you pre-chip your bin and then you get a chip nobody notices as much because it's part of the look and feel of the whole thing. So weathering with either paint and grime um, or, or weathering by chipping paint because that's the look it already had. Um, it, it, it helps, it helps cover up a lot of mistakes. I know a lot of, a lot of people's props, um, live and die by weathering, covering their mistakes. So be lucky. This is Star Wars, not Star Trek. The next part I want to talk about is weathering and weathering is a huge subject. In fact, I have made for weathering videos. So if you want to get a much more in-depth um, idea of how to do what I do, and especially the processes I used on all these bins, um, you can start with this first one. Um, weathering theory is uh, uh, thinking about how it would get dirty, why it would get dirty, what would damage things in that way, and thinking of it, you know, from a point of view of, of the why before you just go to do it, and, and how to avoid a bunch of common weathering mistakes that make it look a little less compelling. So watch that video no matter what weathering method you happen to use. There's lots of ways you can do it, but this should apply to most of them. Um, the second um, weathering video is a uh, um, acrylic wash weathering, which is where you kind of, on a base color, you paint it with kind of dirty colored paints like blacks and darks browns, get it all into the cracks and then wipe it all back off again. Um, so I definitely do that on these bins, and there's a video here for that technique. Um, when I do my acrylic wash weathering on most containers like this, there's usually this area under the rim that you have to flip over to get to, and I really uh, fill that area with grime because it just would collect on something that had been around for a while. There's a chipped paint technique you can do to get um, kind of a chipped look on some of your surfaces, um, like I did on some of these cases. Um, that's this video here, um, and it shows about how to do that. And then finally, another technique that can really add a lot to a, um, a case is to add Fuller's Earth, which is sort of a dusty earth. There's ways you can use it just temporarily and like put it on and wipe it off. It's very easy. There's ways where you can paint a kind of binder of some kind, like I use matte varnish, into all the cracks put your weathering powders in there and wipe it out and they will stay sort of glued in there permanently. So it, it gives it a look that will always be kind of dirty. That video is right here. Um, but the main thing I do on a lot of these cases to give it that kind of beat down weathered Star Wars universe look that a lot of items have, especially cases, things that get slammed and thrown and not taken care of, is to chip the paint. And I will use things like uh, rasps and, um, and coarse sandpaper and gouges and things to give like chips and dents and dings and divots and nicks to something to give it that look of something that's been thrown around a little bit. Um, and I did that on a, a lot of my cases, especially like using really large rasps to like really just kind of you know, chip that paint off intentionally on all the corners and chip down to the lower colors and chip down to the primer and to the black. Um, so that's something that I love to do. Weathering is my favorite part of, of a case because I'm all done building everything and I get to go in and really just enjoy dirting it up and it's more free form and it's fun and you're wiping it out and adding it back in and wiping it out again and getting it wet and taking it all off and doing it again. And by the end, you get this thing that really feels like lived in and worn and beautiful and real. And it can be a bin that you just made that week, but it looks like it's been around for 10 years. So weathering is, is my favorite part. So enjoy that part. Watch those videos if you want to know more. Um, but definitely like 
you know, give give your your cases some grime if you can, because you know, no matter how clean everything is on a ship, there's there's some cases somewhere that are dirty. This tutorial ended up being really long once I edited it together, so I broke it up into four parts. So to see the next part, um, look for a link in the description below, and let's continue building.